example. Uh, good, oh, hang on. <laughs> good morning. Welcome to the second in our series of understanding and responding to mass incarceration 2021 events. My name is Theresa Libby. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a faculty member at, uh, here at Metropolitan State. I'm a co-founder of understanding and responding to mass incarceration, and I teach substance use disorders counseling in the human services department and coordinate our graduate program in co-occurring disorders recovery counseling. That program trains students to become both substance use and mental health disorders counselors. I would like to introduce Raj Seturaju. Dr. Raj is a faculty member in our School of Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice and the other co-founder of this event. He's gonna guide us in a brief mindfulness practice and give the land an enslavement acknowledgement. Dr. Raj. Hey, I, somebody muted me, unmuted me. Oh my God. Okay, don't put me on gallery, just kind of Put me on gallery, no speak of you. Okay, thank you all, appreciate, appreciate. So if you can, right, wherever you are sitting, just wanna invite you to sit or stand in a, play, in a way that you can feel your feet flat on the ground. So if you're wearing shoes, you know, gently kick them off if it's at all possible, right? Otherwise, keep your shoes and place your feet on the ground. As you place your feet on the ground, I want to invite you to focus on your breath. Take a deep breath and gently exhale through your mouth. Inhale, nose. Exhale, mouth. Just gently want to feel, invite you to feel that ground underneath your feet, like you have never felt it before, right? Just kind of plant your feet on the ground, curl your toes and tighten your feet as you breathe in and breathe out. I want to gently invite you to scan your body from the bottom, your feet to your calves. As you breathe in and breathe out, I want to gently invite you to just massage your knees. I, sometimes people hold up a lot of stress in that space. I want to gently invite you to just kind of be focused and mindful about all of the tensions in our bodies, right? Your knees, your thighs. As you breathe in and breathe out, I want to invite you to gently just feel your back. Right? Feel your back, feel your abdomen. As you breathe in and breathe out, I want to invite you to just take a deep breath and feel your entire body with that breath and exhale. Inhale and just kind of check your back, your shoulders. If you're holding any kind of tensions in your back and your shoulders, I want to gently invite you to move your body. Just kind of engage your psoas muscles. Move forward and backwards, forward and backwards. Just kind of Focus on your shoulders and just roll your shoulders, roll your shoulders as you breathe in and breathe out. Gently find that space that you're sitting in, your feet on the ground, scanning your body. Find that space of peace, mindfulness, and pause. Find that space. Find that space that allow you to be in your heart and recognize what's going on in your body. To breathe in and breathe out. I want to gently do a quick reading by Michelle Amster. And the title of her poem is A Justice. Uh, a vision for justice. 
And Michel Amsa says a long, long time ago, or was it last year? Or was it just yesterday? A seed, a seed was planted. A justice tree seed was planted. But how will it grow? How will this justice tree grow when the ground is poisoned with lies and broken treaties? As you breathe in and breathe out. How will it grow when water spills the blood of African and indigenous bodies? As you breathe in and breathe out. How will it grow when the stories of the settler sister sun that scorches the earth, burns our backs and drinks our tears? As you breathe in and breathe out, I want to invite you to kind of not only think about these words and images, but also feel it in your heart and in your body. And Michelle Armstead goes on to say, and we know that our stories are not the same. And we know that justice, yes, justice is a verb. And we know that our work is all about our babies, taking care of the babies the babies until the seven generations, the babies we must love in ourselves, in our community, in our homes, and above all, in our streets. We bear witness, we work to create a safe and a brave space. We learn from the past to see the future. They say Sankofa. We tell our stories, share our narratives. And then, maybe then, this moment becomes a movement. So as you breathe in and breathe out, I wanna gently invite you to again, get out of your head space, come into your heart space and come into your body. These words, these images, the experiences this past year, the 100 years since Tulsa, Oklahoma, 101 years since the lynching in Duluth. All this is sitting in the air, in our bodies and in our emotions. So as we acknowledge the land we are standing on and understand the struggles in our communities, I want to invite you to feel it in your heart space and in your body. Rasma Menekin invites us to work through the pain and not around the pain. Work through the pain. Let us breathe to understand, listen to understand. As you breathe in and breathe out, I want to invite you to open your eyes and be present. Keep your feet on the ground flat. Appreciate. Thank you for being here. Pass it on to Dr. Libby. Raj, thank you so much. May we indeed move through the pain and not around it. Understanding and responding to mass incarceration, or URMI, has been an annual event at Metropolitan State since 2014. Each year we examine the phenomenon of mass incarceration through a different lens and offer opportunities to get involved with issues, organizing, and activism. Our lens for 2020 was planned to be mental illness, public wellness. We had to cancel the event that uh, April due to the pandemic. So for 2021, we've moved the theme forward in a series of four events of which this is the second. Everyone who registered for this will receive information about the um, remaining events. 
I want to take a moment to acknowledge the campus offices that are supporting today's event. Uh, thank you to Dean Maya Sullivan for the allocation from a community health collaborative grant from the Office of the Dean of Students. Thank you to Provost Amy Gort and her office and to President Ginny Arthur and her office. We remain grateful for the strong institutional support for this work. For members of the Metropolitan State community, we want to remind you of next Friday's event, the second annual Day of Honoring, Learning, and Action. It observes the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd and reckons with the work we as a community need to continue to do to respond to it, as, uh, respond to it effectively. Mass incarceration is a function of white supremacy and systematically oppresses already racially marginalized individuals and especially black and indigenous communities. Many who enter the system of mass incarceration bring with them mental health and or substance use issues, while others develop them once they experience incarceration and its consequences. One pathway to healing is through art and music. However, music from black creators is systematically stigmatized and marginalized. This is what today's speaker is going to address. In a moment, we'll introduce our speaker, Naomi Gaines Young. She'll speak until approximately 9.50, after which we'll have time for Q&A. Dr. Darshini Gunatilika and Dr. Dara Krim will be selecting questions from the chat and posing them to Ms. Gaines Young. Please refrain from entering your questions in the chat until asked for them, which will be around 940. Following the Q&A in a short break, we'll we, we will reconvene at 1020 and Dr. Raj will give us our charge for circle discussions and breakout rooms. We'll conclude with a report out beginning at 1105 and we'll wrap up the morning at 1145. Please note that Ms. Gaines Young talk is being recorded by Metropolitan State and will be made available online at a later date. So as always in Zoom meetings, please be keenly aware of keeping your mic muted. It's now my honor and pleasure to turn it over to Sharon Brooks Green, who will introduce our speaker. Ms. Brooks Green is a graduate of the Metro State uh, Master of Advocacy and Political Leadership Program, a PhD candidate in public Poli policy and administration at Walden University. She's the founder of Peace of Hope, author of The Other Side of the Wall, and a longtime member of the URMI Planning Committee. Sharon? <laughs> Thank you, Theresa. I really appreciate you for the introduction. Understanding and responding to mass incarceration is not just a forum, but a movement. In our eight years of presentation, we've created interactive spaces where topics dear to my heart, such as the forgotten families of the imprisoned, women in the system, and voices from the inside, and many other conversations that have been featured in URMI have inspired action and, and uh, with your collaboration, much needed collaboration, input of understanding and responding to mass incarceration, this phenomenon. This year is no different. The movement continues even more so. Hi, I am Karen Brooks Green, and I'm honored to present our featured keynote speaker, Naomi Gaines Young, whose title presentation, Post Trauma, Present Problems, and Soul Solutions How the Healing of the Souls of Ameri African Americans is Thwarted by the Censorship and Elimination of Culturally Positive and Spiritual Hip Hop. Ms. Naomi is a published author, singer, MC, songwriter, and mental health advocate professional. She has relentlessly dedicated her skills, her talent, and her artistry to raising awareness about the dangers of ignoring mental health issues. Ms. Gaines Young speaks openly and honestly about the losses and pain in her past while continuing to move forward in her future, sharing for all to learn from, especially within her own community. Her production, Side 2, Woodnet, and John 316 are hot tracks that you want to listen to and immerse yourself in the videos as well. As a fan of her music and in solidarity with her message, I respectfully welcome our keynote speaker for the 2021 Understanding and Responding to Mass Incarceration Movement, Ms. Naomi Gaines Young. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody being here. Um, I really appreciate it. So I want to start the presentation off 
um, with a poem I wrote to kind of set the tone. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Imagine if there were no country. Matter of fact, never mind. John Lennon already asked us that. Imagine if a man had a beautiful dream. Wait, that was envisioned by the man known as Dr. King. Imagine if someone told Black people to defend themselves and have pride. Oh, someone did, but that's exactly why Malcolm X died. Imagine if MCs put positive lyrics in their rap songs. Many have, but receive no marketing dollars, thus they are unknown or ignored. Imagine if someone came down from the heavens to tell you, you are heavenly love, so move forward. Someone did, but they hung that brother and nailed him onto two wooden boards. Imagine if a brave woman had the audacity to free the slaves at night. Harriet did, but they recently made a movie that was a cinematic lie. Imagine if there is a charismatic man who can make enemies companions, but damn, that's exactly why the FBI and the CPD killed Mr. Fred Hampton. Now I want you to imagine if someone shook their ass in a music video and performed ratchet rap songs. No need to imagine she did in one album of the year Grammy Award. Now imagine if he had rainbow hair, teeth, and a large numerical face tat. No need to imagine he got an early release from prison and a $10 million recording contract. Now imagine if he promised action for Black people, police reform, that we still didn't get. Oh, no need to imagine the dude I'm talking about is our current US president. Imagine if she fights, scratches out eyeballs, and makes glass fly. No need to imagine, check VH1. She's celebrated as a beautiful housewife. So why is it that we can imagine pain and unfairness from yesterday and all throughout history? But one thing we can't seem to imagine is the, senator, is the sinister motives behind those who control the information in the mainstream. Again, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being with me today. My name is Naomi Gaines Young, AKA my artist name is NG Young. So welcome to this presentation, post-trauma, post-trauma, present problems and soul solutions. How the healing of the souls of African-Americans is thwarted by the censorship and elimination of culturally positive and spiritual hip hop. Too often black people only know their history in this country as slaves. Also, if anything is known before slavery, it is usually the stereotypical beliefs about Africa and our African ancestors. I love this quote from Atlantis Browder, who is the daughter of famed archeologist and historian, Anthony Browder. Atlantis says, if black history was represented in a thousand page book, slavery would begin and end on page 999. To add to that, I would say black history since slavery ended right up until present day would begin and end on the last page of that book, 1000. Slavery is a widely known historical fact, but it's just such a small part of black history. It is also one that we analyze the least. I happen to feel not knowing our collective history as a people causes much of our present trauma. I also feel not knowing your personal family history is traumatic as well. Do you know what your mom went through as a child? What about your auntie and uncle? For those of you who still have living grandparents, do you know the stories of what your grandma and grandpa went through? How about your own birth story? I tell my children their birth stories every few years on their birthday. I tell them stories about when they were babies and what we went through, funny stories about my relationship with their father, how we met and fell in love, et cetera. I believe for our own mental health, we need to tell our stories. I will briefly tell you part of mine. I was born and raised on the South side of Chicago. I grew up in Robert Taylor Projects, just like Kirby Puckett. 
I moved to Minnesota in 1997 with my then only one-year-old son, Jelani. And since living here, I gave birth to three more children, a daughter, Kayla, and then twin sons, Supreme and Sincere. After the birth of the twins, I suffered from postpartum depression, which went untreated and eventually morphed into postpartum psychosis. For those of you who don't know, postpartum psychosis is not just depression after giving birth, it is coupled with a severe case of schizophrenia. After a series of unfortunate events before, during, and after my pregnancy with the twins, I became fearful of them. And then later I became fearful for them. After 21 911 calls, both from my family and my neighbors, after over a dozen hospitalizations in a six month period, after being turned away for mental health treatment multiple times due to a lack of parity coverage from my medical insurance, I did the unthinkable. On July 4th, 2003, I drove to the Taste of Minnesota, walked down the street until I came to the bridge and jumped into the Mississippi River after throwing my twins sons in. A bystander by the name of Richard Dahlstrom jumped in to save us. Supreme and I were rescued. My other son, sincere understanding, Allah died. Now the most important part of my story and really any story is not the what, it's not the when or even the who. The most important part of any story is the why. Why did it happen? How many of you became comfortable, uncomfortable after hearing my story? It is one that is difficult to hear, I know, and it hurts me a little bit every time I tell it. But I imagine it's because some of that discomfort is because you don't know the why. I only gave you the what. I basically gave you the Cliff Notes version of my story. Many details are missing from what I told you. Well, you see, trauma works the same way. When you don't understand that a complete story of suffering and trauma, be it yours or others, it causes more trauma and suffering. So here's a more detailed version of my story. Here is the why. The day 9-11 happened was the beginning of the end for me. I was at work as a medical records clerk at a major health clinic in the cities. I was also at the time a practicing Muslim and was dressed in the full garb at work. My coworkers were all gathered around a small 13 inch television watching the coverage. And that day, everyone was in a state of shock. The next day, however, everyone was in a state of anger. Charts were thrown at me. People talked about burning Muslims and we're gonna burn them so bad. The amount of anti-Islamic sentiment was staggering. That day, I walked off my job. The day after 9-11 was the last time I held a steady job before I went to prison. Later, some other Muslim women I knew told me they took their children out of school due to them being bullied and beat up. They even went up so far as to go and change their Muslim sounding names and enroll them in schools far from the ones they were attending. I desperately wanted proof that things were better than this. So, I had my television on CNN 24 seven. Instead of hearing the hope I searched for, I listened to reports of physical abuse and even torture and death of detainees at Guantanamo Bay prison in Cuba where they were housing suspected terrorists. Many of the men were being held, at least from what I was hearing, was for having the same last name as one of the would-be hijackers or were just born in the wrong part of the world. These events and my perception of these events fared my fear and paranoia and was the trigger for the onset of my mental illness, specifically at that time, depression and anxiety. Months later, when I gave birth to my twin sons, their dad, also a practicing Muslim, named them Sincere Understanding Allah and Supreme Knowledge Allah. By the time the twins were born, their dad and I were not together. We had split peacefully months earlier. Although he was still there somewhat for his sons, he was not there for me. If you can imagine growing up Christian for years and years as I had, next converting to Islam and listening to the hatred of Muslim and Islam for months and months, and finally being cooped up in my home as a social outcast with my babies, 
who the world believed were terrorists and my television on CNN 24 seven and my very, very sick mind for weeks and weeks and even more weeks without proper treatment. In 2003, between January and July, I had been hospitalized a total of seven times. My lawyer told me and my family and my neighbors had called 911 for my strange behavior and psychotic episodes a total of 21 times. There was a mountain of evidence to support then prove that I was symptomatic from my mental illness. But back then the maximum stay at an inpatient hospital that insurance would pay for was two weeks when a person was displaying symptoms without any violent outbursts. I wasn't violent, never had been violent, never been to jail or had a criminal history. In the end, that didn't matter. Fear and paranoia held me hostage mentally. On one of my episodes, I walked around holding my twin sons in my arms for eight hours straight. I felt the people around me, even my family, weren't who they said they were. Like they were imposters, like that movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I became so delusional and paranoid. I believe the FBI at any moment was going to kick in my door, drag me and my children out and take us to Guantanamo Bay and torture and kill us slowly. To me, this was so real. The world believed all Muslims were terrorists, right? So that means so were me and my children. And I had seen on television how the world treats terrorists. During this time, I read in the book, Behold a Pale Horse. It is a book written by William C. Cooper, a formal naval intelligence officer for the US government. This is like a tell-all book he wrote of secret government conspiracies and other hidden information from the public. He wrote about one secret government program implemented to decrease the birth of minorities by praising and supporting a gay agenda and thereby decreasing the population growth of minorities who they hoped would adopt this lifestyle because gays can't have children. He went on to say that after the gays have served their purpose, they too would also be exterminated. The name of this government program was called MK Naomi. On page 168 in this book, The Behold the Pale Horse, it states, since large populations were to be decimated, the ruling elite decided to target the undesirable elements of society. Specifically targeted were the black, Hispanic, and homosexual populations. The poor homosexuals were encouraged on the one hand and scheduled for extinction on the other. Again, the name of this program was called MK Naomi. I couldn't believe I had read that. You see, the worst thing a psychotic person can have is physical evidence to support their own delusion. To me, this was the smoking gun that proved that me, to me, that they really were after me and my babies, but not because we were terrorists, but because we were black. So combined with that book, the growing hostility towards Muslims in the wake of 9-11, a lack of culturally competent treatment and professional support, and the ignorance of my family and myself about what mental illness was, I did the unthinkable. You know the rest. This is the why of my story. Now notice how different you feel after hearing more information about my trauma. This is how we heal. We heal by understanding why we and others have been hurt and continue to hurt and why even we sometimes hurt others. Only then do we begin to heal. The purpose of this conference is to go deeper on the subjects of mass incarceration and mental illness. So understanding what fuels these two vehicles is ironically where the power to eliminate them both can also be found. Just like understanding the reasons for another's trauma, like hearing more of my story, or understanding the reason for the trauma of an entire group like African-Americans is also where the power to eliminate these issues forever can be found. To take back our power, we must always start with why. 
Why are we as a people still experiencing trauma? Let's talk about it. You have to understand the psychological residuals of slavery. What does that mean? Well, Dr. Joy Jaguri came up with a diagnosis called post-traumatic slave syndrome. So she defines post-traumatic slave syndrome. This is her book. I, I do recommend reading it. It is a great read. She defines it as a set of beliefs and actions associated with or related to multi-generational trauma experienced by African-Americans that include, but are not limited to, undiagnosed and untreated post-traumatic stress disorder, which enslaved Africans suffered and then later passed down to their ascendants. There are ways we unconsciously behave today that have been passed down from our ancestors who developed these behaviors as a way to cope with the harsh realities of living in slavery to survive. I'll give you one such example, also given by Dr. Joy, Joy DeGuri, and I will just paraphrase. Imagine two women, one black and one white, sitting in the stands watching their son's high school football game. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, Helen, I just wanted to compliment you on how well your son is doing. The white mother responds and says, oh, thank you. Yes, he just won the science award. Did you know that? He increased his GPA this semester. He's in the chess club now. His uncle is an astronaut. The boy is brilliant. And she's just oozing with pride. And before the white mother can sit back fully, she realizes that the black mother is actually excelling her son in several areas. And she responds to the black mother to say, wait, you're talking about my son. Your son is the one who's really coming along. The black mother says, child, that boy is something else. Woo, he is a handful. Girl, you just don't know that boy works my nerves. Now the behavior is common. It's common among culture lines. The secret some of us know is that the black mother is actually really proud of her son. So why is she doing this? Let's rewind the tape back to slavery. A black mother is standing in a field with her young children and Massa comes around and asks and says, Minnie, is that your boy? Oh, he's really coming along, isn't he? He's a strong one, ain't he? What is Minnie gonna do then? Oh no, sir, he's shiftless and stupid. The boy ain't got good sense. Why is she doing this? If he's a boy, I don't want you to sell him. If he's a girl, I don't want you to breed her. This is called maladaptive social behavior from living in a hostile environment. Most black people never unlearn that. We know that we pass down characteristics through our genetic code like eye color, features, body type, et cetera. However, research has shown that human beings also pass down our emotional and psychological trauma in our genetic memory. We transfer the stimulants and stressors related to the trauma we suffered to our descendants. This is known as epigenetics, also called transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. The story of the two mothers at the Suns football game is one of the ways this socially plays out. Another example is when black men and women had to pretend on the plantation they did not love each other or like each other out of fear of being sold away or worse. Now, unfortunately today, it has become our reality. If any of you have read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, you have heard of the 10,000 hour rule. Gladwell explains in his book that to perfect any skill and get it down to where performing it becomes effortless as easily as blinking your eyes. Gladwell goes on to say that these 10,000 hours can be achieved if you practice this skill for 20 hours a week for 10 years. And there's your 10,000 hours. Stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this. Let's just say for the sake of this argument that slavery and racism was practiced for 20 hours a week since the first slave ship docked in Virginia in 1619. Let's imagine that racism and slavery were only legal for 20 hours a week and that after 10 years, America's 10,000 hours of racism and white supremacy became as easy and effortless as blinking its eyes. Let's do the math. 
first slave ships docked in Jamestown, Virginia in 1619 to the end of the Civil War in 1865. That is 246 years using the calculation of Malcolm Gladwell, that's 200, that's 215,496 hours. So if in that time, there are 21.54 sets of 10,000 hours. 21.54 sets of 10,000 hours. Now let's go from 1865 to 1965, the end of the Civil War and the passing of the Civil Rights Act. You have 100 years of lynching, institutional racism, Jim Crow, Black codes. In that 100 years, there's 104,000 hours which equals 10.4 sets of 10,000 hours. Now go from 1865 to 2021. That's 56 years. That's 58,240 hours of racial profiling, police brutality, redlining, gentrification, wealth gaps, etc. That's 5.8 sets of 10,000 hours. Now for a total, using the calculations that slavery was legal for 20 hours a week, that's 37.746 sets of 10,000 hours. And that's only, that's only if we are not considering what is really factual that racism, slavery, white supremacy, and other these other issues is a 24 hour seven days a week occurrence. Now let's look at legal slavery, which is mass incarceration, the topic of this conference. I spent 15 years in prison for the death of my son. 80% of the women around me were there for non-violent drug offenses. So if racism and white supremacy has perfected and expanded its global reach, then the people it rewards and oppresses has perfected being its victims. And yes, the folks that this system rewards are to its victims. There is victims, even if they benefit from the system, and even if they don't believe or acknowledge their own victimhood. We don't like to admit this, but it's true. Nowhere is this better illustrated than in the global phenomenon and powerful medium that now has been weaponized against us, hip hop. Let me give you a brief history of hip hop. Hip hop was birthed out of the dirt left upon our feet after the failed civil rights and black power movements of the 60s and 70s. America took precautions to be sure potential leaders of future movements could not be financed by the black dollar as prior movements and their leaders had been. So then they decided to economically castrate the black community. They closed factories in the inner cities then they eliminated the skilled trades from the high schools that provided the skills that black people, especially black men, used to become gainfully employed right after high school and take care of their families. In addition to removing the trade programs, they also took the musical instruments out of the schools. If this weren't enough, it's been recently proven that the CIA deliberately flooded the black community with crack cocaine to wipe out the community even further. The movie Kill the Messenger, it's on Netflix, tells the incredible true story of the journalist who broke this story, Gary Webb, which by the way, he was found shot twice in the head. His death was ruled a suicide, right? There were many other casualties in this social engineering war that prevented the black community from making similar social and political strides as they had done in the civil rights era. However, in the middle of all this poverty, crime, despair, death, something powerful was born. That something was hip hop. Basically, persons both named and unnamed, known and unknown, became tired of all the violence surrounding them. So someone said, hey man, let's try to outdo each other rhetorically like we do when we play in the Dirty Dozens, just like Muhammad Ali did to his opponents. And then we're gonna make it rhyme and then we're gonna call it a battle. That way we can settle our differences without violence. And whoever wins, they the real dope. Then someone else said, damn, they took our musical instruments out of school. So let's take these tables and turn them into drums and beat on them. And hey, you over there make noises with your mouth to make even more sounds like our elders did with handball. We're going to call it beatboxing. 
then hey, you dude over there, cool heart, gonna take the only thing we have access to use, a record player, and then we're gonna use our parents' vinyl records and turn both of those things into an instrument. And from this, the hip hop DJ was born. Hip hop was the first fubu for us by us. Make no mistake about this. The music industry and radio stations wanted nothing to do with hip hop or rap music, at least until the year I was born. <laughs> in 1979, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang was the first rap record to sell over 1 million copies. Damn, right there, everything changed. You see, the, when the record companies and radio stations began to realize how much money could be made from this thing called hip hop, they began to slowly gain control over it and financially exploit it. Today, rap is the dominant, dominant genre. It outsells rock, pop, and country. Hip hop is a multi-billion dollar industry. That's billion with a B. One of my biggest issues with the state of rap music today is the lack of variety of subject matter. There's only one type of rap being pushed and promoted. People will often say, well, that's what sells. That's what people want. I both agree and disagree with this statement. And I'll explain in an analogy I call the produce section. Imagine if you are a customer who comes to your neighborhood grocery store's produce section. Since the store opening, you and your family have been customers along with everyone else in the neighborhood. You enjoy going to the produce section because they have a, such a wondrous variety of fruits and vegetables. They have bananas, cherries, grapes, melons, onions, green peppers, and everything else you could possibly want. Sometimes you want fruit, sometimes you want vegetables, but nonetheless, whatever you want is there on the floor for you and others to freely choose between. Now imagine you've been coming to the store for years and then all of a sudden you notice the gradual shortage of the varieties of produce available. Then slowly over time, more and more is being taken away, which you find strange, but you figure like everything else, times are changing and maybe the store is under new management, which it is. And you begin to notice that as other varieties are being removed, it's being replaced by apricots. Now you have nothing against apricots, even though you prefer other produce, you do indulge in a few apricots from time to time. After a while, you just accept this rather than make a fuss because you are working, you're able to cook less using fresh produce. And as you become a parent, you don't have uh, much time to prepare meals and you usually just go with something that's quick and easy or pre-made. So you start to bring your kids to the store. And by this time, there's only apricots on the floor. Your children don't remember the produce section being fully stocked with varieties of fruits and vegetables as it once was. So you finally ask the store manager, hey, what happened to all those other fruits and vegetables you used to carry? He said, well, this is what's popular. They sell, this is what sells now. Well, those other fruits and vegetables sold just fine. Everyone liked the variety, not just me. He replies, they're still here. We got them in the back room together in boxes labeled fruit and veggies. It's dark back there, so you gotta bring your own flashlight and dig through the boxes. Disappointed, you start to walk out before another customer whispers to you and says, hey, I wondered the same thing. And I found out that the Apricot Corporation bought out almost 95% of all the grocery stores and they push apricots and products made from apricots so people can just buy more apricots. And you go, wait, that doesn't make any sense. The other produce sold just fine. No wonder the stuff doesn't sell. It's not out here on the floor. It's not being made available like them damn apricots. Why don't they sell the other stuff they used to? <laughs> because the other stuff from before causes good health and longevity. Well, what's wrong with that? Because it's counterproductive to the Apricot Corporation's primary investments and business goals, which is, these apricots are laced with the chemical that causes cancer. The Apricot Corporation secretly owns and has billions of dollars invested into cancer centers, oncologists, and even chemotherapy medication. They cause the cancer, then invest in the so-called treatment of it. Hey, you should come to our meetings. We teach people the truth using conscious rap music. I sell old school fruit out the truck of my car. You want a banana? 
This is the hip hop industry in a nutshell. So the original produce section was once the wondrous variety of the different styles and subgenres of rap music back in the day. The deliberate and gradual reduction and elimination of the variety of different fruits and vegetables is the record companies and radio stations eliminating and deciding what's made available in the mainstream, which is the produce floor. The fruits and veggies that were once on the main floor and were regulated to the back room in this analogy and boxes mixed together is when people say it's positive rap out there, you just gotta look for it. And finally, the mass distribution, marketing and promotion of violent anti-intelligence, materialistic and misogynist and crime ridden rap are the apricots. What many folks don't know is that these corporations that control 95% of the record companies and radio stations are also one of the biggest investors in, prison, in the prison industry, industrial complex. So on one hand, they promote this type of rap music, apricots, and on the other, they build, invest in the private prison industry. Interesting, isn't it? But don't take my word for it. Listen for yourself. Can you increase the volume, Naomi, please? Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. No worries. Yeah, my volume's up full blast. Um, current slide. No worries. Okay. Sorry about that. I tried to have it as, yeah, it's all the way up. <laughs> Sorry. Wait, one more video. Hey, Yomi, I'm so sorry. I don't think the participants can hear the um can hear videos so none of that was heard no huh? afraid not am i muted no you're not muted um okay. all right i don't know what's going on because my computer is turned up the volume is turned up as loud it's on 100 yeah i don't know is there a separate zoom audio uh volume no, 
No. Okay. I'm not. So I, I'm basically. sorry that I'm not sure what to suggest, but I don't. Okay. I don't have a solution. Okay. Well. All right. I'll just paraphrase what they said and go with that. Um, Oh, I'm sorry about that, guys. So I guess you guys couldn't hear. I guess you guys couldn't hear basically what the video was saying. It was people talking about that the record companies and 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 the radio stations are all owned by three corporations, and they control what's made hot, what's not, what's omitted. So it's kind of like backing up what I said in my analogy of the produce section. They only put out what they want to, and this is the only thing that they put out. So when people say, oh, well, uh, the music is full of sex and violence and all that, well, that is the record companies and the organizations, by the way, also on the other end, promote, invest, and build private prisons. So basically the videos was just backing up the analogy of what I was saying. And when people say, oh, it's, people don't wanna hear that. Well, how can they choose from anything but what they can choose from? So I wanna recite a poem I wrote, which is a paradox of the way I see today's mainstream rap artists. Don't get me wrong, I greatly respect a lot of them. I know that they're being used as pawns unknowingly in a dangerous and rigged chess game. I empathize when they don't know. However, I get pretty pissed when they do know and don't care. So this piece I call brilliant is addressed to them. I know he is brilliant because I watched the way he killed it. I mean, the slick shit when he spit quit, but something deeper, I'd be like, oh, is this it? He let his mind atrophy and his spirit doesn't even know she, I can tell by the way he degrades and humiliates me. His only comeback is, it's just entertainment. How is that when you spit the same shit that Willie Lynch did to manifest enslavement? You're like a slave who bragged about his chains on the slave ship. I can only imagine what he could do with a free mind if even for one time, if even for one line, Spit a bar and let in some sunshine. Darkness creeps back and is no more time to even the score. No longer will I be your whore. Dancing to music that lowers me to the floor. Intelligence can be used for good or ill. I understand that this rhyme brings you and yours meals. But how many self-esteems and innocence in the process did you kill? <laughs> Talk about a free will. As I said before, I know I know he is brilliant. So how come all that comes out is ignorance? One of my spiritual teachers, um, Kabe Kime, has a quote that says, when someone tells a perfect lie, the truth becomes unbelievable. So let's talk about monsters for a second. It's easy to kill a monster. So imagine if you saw this thing in your basement, um, you'd be scared and my guess is that you would probably wanna kill it if you saw it in your home. And I'm also guessing you wouldn't feel too bad about it if you did, because it's easy to kill a monster. All you have to do is look at history to see what I mean. Look at the Jews before World War II. Do you really think that the Third Reich just woke up one morning and said today, we're going to round up all the European Jews, put them in concentration camps, and later the gas chamber. No. There was a years-long campaign to vilify the Jews via media, print, and film. The Third Reich portrayed them as monsters first. They had news reports broadcasting them as monsters. They had films showing them as monsters. They had newspapers writing articles about them as monsters first. They did this because they knew that when the killing, torture, and gassing began, no one would care. Why? Because it's easy to kill a monster. The way Black men are portrayed in music, media, and print is the fuel packing America's prisons, justifying police killings, and praising the public for denying Black people basic human rights. 
I am told all around America they've built concentration camps. Interesting. The difference between the Jews of World War II is that the Jews didn't participate in their own character assassination like mainstream rap artists do, like guests on Jerry Springer and Mari do, like stars of reality TV do. I largely feel these individuals don't know they're being used to this end, but I can guarantee you these apricot corporations do. And now all of you who didn't know this truth, now you do as well. The time has come for you to choose who you support in this struggle. And by the way, this creature here is not evil. It's called a gargoyle. And they have been believed for years to believe to ward off evil. And you will find many of them are carved on top of cathedral rooftops and found in church churchyards. So I can only speak to me as to the solutions to this problem. Some will probably say we need prison reform or more funding for mental health care or better laws. I really feel these things are great. However, I feel there needs to be a shift in consciousness in each of us first. This system is not the physical structures, buildings, laws, and policies. The system is powered by people. Earlier, I called the civil rights movement a failure. Yes, laws were changed, but that didn't solve the problem. Yes, blacks, women, and gays were able to have certain rights, but that didn't solve the problem. The Civil Rights Act allowed us to live more comfortably in the problem, to exist in the problem, but it never solved the problem because you can't legislate thinking, internal transformation, and attitudes. The problem is racism. This is the problem. That went absolutely nowhere. Racism is so ingrained into our laws and institutions is damn near invisible. Hell, it's airborne at this point and we're all infected. Remember those 10,000 hours I talked about earlier. The funding and reform people often suggest needs to happen usually goes towards maintaining the problem existing within physical structures of the system. It's the people who uphold and the ones under the control of these physical structures who are in the need of reformation, the funding, the healing. For me, this is where the work needs to be done. So having conferences like this, having trainings, I'm talking about real trainings with measurable practical goals and outcomes. We need to heal the residual harm done to both those employed by the system and those oppressed by the system. And as I said, this requires a shift in consciousness, which is a personal choice, but it's a choice that must be made nonetheless. Yes, hip hop has been weaponized against all of us on both sides, but I survived my 15 years in prison with hip hop inside of me. And we've already seen that hip hop has the potential to destroy, but you can't die, deny that it also has a redemptive power as well. I'm living proof. So in closing, I'd like to share with you one of my music videos entitled Side, because the time now has come for all of us to be paired, prepared to choose which one we are on. And I'll just load it up here in a sec. Naomi, this yes. is, sorry to interrupt. One of our participants suggested that when you, in your screen, share screen options, mm -hmm. there's a share audio option. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Um, okay. I think it's toward the bottom of the screen. Okay. Thank you for the tip, because I was. <laughs> so, okay. Um, okay. So here. Okay, more screen sharing, share audio. So they say it's, a, it's at the bottom. Oh, share. 
mute start video. So where is the share audio button at? I can't check for it because you're sharing the screen right now. Okay. Um, share screen. Okay, here we go. Let's try to look. Share on, the, on the bottom left corner of the, the share screen, there's a share sound option. You see that on your? Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. Naomi's going to have to unshare her screen to see that option. She'll have okay. to reshare it. Okay, stop sharing. All right. I am so sorry. This was this went so much smoother when I. Uh, You're fine. Computer. Okay, share. So you can okay, share. All right. So let's go back to the presentation because it's actually on here. You know, screen share. So I'm going to start it. If you guys can hear it, let me know. If you can't, then I probably just have to skip it. I hope not. Can you guys hear that? Beautiful. And the Lord said unto them, Know this, that in the last days there will be perilous times. Men shall be lovers of money, lovers of themselves, boastful, proud, disobedient to the elders, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Eat not the fruit of such. Who said I ain't know? The time has come now to choose a side. Who said I ain't know? Who said? I know how to be to me that's the purpose of a real mc we are the news reporters of the streets but the people perish when it's we that can't see we be for ourselves judge others and don't care egos in charge pimping with a conscious vote card i'm not here to attack and condemn that's whack but then y'all get the trip and i'm like fuck that the time for silence has passed and shaking ass, putting money above people and worshiping cash. If you're rapping about killing niggas, making eight figures, popping bottles and fucking bitches, I'm not with it. But I used to be, so I understand. I was a child back then, I'm the woe of a man. Do what you gotta do or do as you please. Time is short, did you hear? Yo, he can't breathe. The time has come now to choose a side. Who said I only know? Who said? Who said? Who said I only know? The time has come now to choose a side. Who said I only know? But what would you live or die? You can't hide whatever is in your heart. It'll come out, yo, through your words and through your art. We gotta learn to take responsibility for our own influence in the world of negativity. Do you? That's the beauty of this thing called choice. Just know, my fellow rappers, you have a voice. Better rise up and get a plan. If not, just know you're on the side with David Duke and his Klansman. Don't believe me? Then let's go down the list. Proof is in the pudding. Smell it, stir it, yo, and taste the shit. Kill a brother, hate each other, and destroy self. Sound familiar, go figure. Now that's a triple check. Still don't care? Even though aware, triple threat. Good news, it's not too late, my love. Yo, it's time left. I give you my hand if you need some help. You ain't never alone or gotta do it by yourself. Profess. Who said I only know? The time has come now to choose a side. For 
we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, in our heart spaces, those that desecrate the sacred. Which side are you facing? If you're mad at this statement, you have already chosen your placement. Thank you all for having me. That concludes my presentation. Sorry, it was a little wacky there. So if you have any questions, I think we're, uh, I'm not, if we're gonna open up for questions, but yeah. yeah. Naomi Gaines Young, thank you for everything that you've contributed us this morning. Just so, so appreciated. Thank you, it's my pleasure. Thank you my for your, yeah, yeah, your brilliance and the power of your art and for bringing it into this space this morning. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We are going to take some time for questions. Uh, we have uh, almost 20 minutes for that. I've also tried to reassure people in the chat that when we post the video of this presentation, we'll also post the videos of the, the two that we um, that we couldn't hear and your uh, uh, and the one you just played as well, your yeah. work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, two of our faculty members, Dr. Derek Krim and Dr. Darshini Gunatilika are going to monitor the chat for questions. I see a couple are starting to come in. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn it, oh, oh, and say who they are. <laughs> Dr. Krim and, uh, and Dr. Gunatilika are both faculty in our human services department, um, teaching in, um, in uh, addiction counseling and mental health counseling. So I will turn it over to them. Thank you. I appreciate that, uh, Naomi. I believe that the reason that questions do not come right away is because it's like a good meal and we're tasting flavors and seasoning and we're absorbing and all. Thank you so much for dissecting the issues uh, like is not heard. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, I want to talk more, but let's get to some questions. I have a question right here, Naomi, and I hope mm -hmm. you can hear me, but yeah. the question is this. Can you speak to why you believe so much of the destructive hip-hop music sells so much? I know you mentioned the systematic mass production of it, but why do you think such content is so popular, especially uh, amongst so many young white people as well. I love your poem mentioned how the degrading bottom shaking female artists win the latest Grammy Awards or won the latest Grammy Awards. How does that happen? Hmm. Uh, I wish we could have heard the video um, because it, it really went into the psychology because these corporations and we don't realize corporations employ thousands and thousands of psychologists to get to the mindset, to infuse ideas into your head. So part of it is, first of all, cutting off what is positive. You can't have that. You can't have none of that. Um, we, we can't have none of that. So now you only have to offer them uh, whatever is on the table. And if they're very hungry, they're going to eat it. And, mm. and, and so we talked about the, the um, a lot of people don't know like the philosophies or ways of other religions, you know, especially Raj in the beginning gave a meditative. Well, some of these songs are mantras. Even if mantras and affirmations can make somebody feel encouraged and confident and actually manifest that which they're seeing, then why doesn't that apply to negativity? You can do the same thing you do. That's the unfortunate name. Water saves us life. We couldn't die without it. But there's a such thing as drinking too much water. You can mm. actually get sick from it. The sun provides us all this kind of energy, but it still burns if you get too much of it. So it's like, if these things can work for that, why they couldn't work for that? So that's one thing. One thing is that's, that's the only thing being offered. That's the only thing being offered, number one. Number two the reason why it's purchased more by white kids, I would say goes back to that 10,000 hours of racism because we don't want it. Like you take those same, same artists. I'll give you an example, Eminem fans. 
he's he's also all all every rapper ever and he's re, he, he is considered the goat and i've heard you know people like yeah eminem's dope yeah he has these lyrics but i also think his narrative his his story is more relatable to that audience his fan base so you could take somebody that's equally i've had this discussion who's equally lyrical who eminem says i ain't even better than but because their content is relatable to most black people you know that he's going to sell with his demographic he's not yeah. going to cross over to the demographic of eminem's fans simply yeah. because they can't relate the story his history his story is powerful don't get me wrong but he's speaking to an audience who gets that just like nas is speaking to an audience who gets the oppression the, the lifestyle of black people so it it's also it's, it's it's many things it's many many things and also we, we're just gonna keep it sex sales. We know sex sales. And because it's like telling somebody who put 10 sugars in their coffee, 10 su sugar substitutes, which is way, way more uh, sweeter than regular sugar and telling them to go to two scoops of grain sugar. Mm -hmm. They're gonna taste it and it's not gonna be satisfying because they've been ODing and used to 10, sugar substitutes in their coffee so it's like that high fructose corn syrup of hip-hop versus a bowl of fruit what do you think people are gonna digest <laughs> yeah. and want more and that's just the reality of what it is mm. so. all right thank you i think uh, my colleague has the next question hi miss Gaines. hi um all right so i think you may have touched on this a little bit but you know Possibly we could you could answer this um, um, with more of your sharing. Um, so this participant saying all of this makes me so darn angry, and I'm ready to take to the streets. Miss <laughs> James Young, how do you balance anger and hope and action? Any best practices or tactics you use to balance these strong responses? to the work in order to keep moving forward. Thank you for being here and sharing your insights. Mm -hmm. I just wanna say people give a bad rap to anger or the uh, extreme emotions and you're, you have that anger, but anger lets you know something's wrong. The important thing is not to stay there. Embrace your anger, but also anger is a surface emotion. What's under? the anger what are you most angry about and why really really take that that anger go deeper with it because i'll just speak for me you asked me i've been angry many many times but what does that come from when i uncover my anger it's because i feel powerless mm. and the anger may it, it gives me some degree of power i feel like i got control because i'm being angry at the situation when really underneath that, I feel powerless. I feel a little hopeless that I can make a difference and change. So therefore let me act out physically because I can do something about the physical. I can do something about that. And that's the only thing that I can do is something physical to make me feel like I have some degree of control over the situation. Number two, I really channel, and I know everybody's not an artist. I channel, that anger is in my music. I, if you mm. heard it, heard sigh, I'm cursing because sometimes, sometimes doing the right thing ain't doing the right thing. Like, you know, so I put that in my music. I put that in my art. I put that frustration because I know some people can't put it in a song and make a video but I'm speaking to people who feel the same way I do. And at the same time, I'm doing exercising some degree of control and action and empowerment. So you got to find a creative outlet for, and it doesn't matter what it is. I don't know if you want to crochet, stitch, play ball, doing something, channel that energy. Also find out what is the, what is the feelings underneath that anger? Because again, Anger, anger is a surface emotion. So going deeper and going under that to figure out what, what's, what, what are you really angry about? What's underneath that anger? And then acting accordingly, whatever that is for you. So. Yep. Uh, 
I am really happy that uh, of the next question is asked, even though um, it, it, it just really captures and impacts everybody on a deep level as far as how you will respond. So Yolanda asks, with your story, were you able to heal the relationships with your children and your family? Absolutely, that's a very important question. I couldn't have survived. I survived with hip hop, but I survived with my family. Luckily for me, I had family to take my kids and raise them. Um, they were around. Um, my two oldest children were able to visit. I was able to parent from prison. The, um, my son who is now 19 now, which we have a wonderful relationship, he was just here spending the night in my house a couple of weeks ago. So we stay, and I've even brought him on one of my um, speaking engagements where I tell my story so he can hear and see the PowerPoint. And he's like, now I get it, mom. But throughout those years, he's, he's had my family in his, you know, your mom was sick. Well, what does that mean? What, do you, what happened? And he had me to talk to him. I can only talk to him on the phone to ask me difficult questions that I knew he needed an answer to. So that relationship is, is healing. It's, it's, we're still, he's still learning. He's, we still growing and I can't make up for the time that I wasn't in his life, but we have from here to the rest of both of our lives mm. to heal and remedy that. And so I was always, I never walked into a courtroom where it wasn't a, a crowd of my family. Cause luckily for me, I'm someone who comes from a very big family. My grandmother had nine children. My great grandmother had 20. So I, if someone tells you they're my cousin, they're probably not lying, <laughs> but they even had to change the rule about how many guests could be in a court hearing because of my family. So that's something I know I've been blessed with that a lot of people don't, even though they may have the tools, they may have uh, the resources of uh, professionals or social work professionals. If you don't have that family piece, people really can, it really can go left for you because you don't have anybody else but you advocating for you. But I had my family the whole ride and they're still here and they, and they support me immensely. My sister, raised my children. She took my children when she was 21 years old, didn't have any children. She was living in a studio apartment and she was in college, but yet she took my children and raised, she, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a heartbeat. She was like, no, mm. they're not going to foster care, bring my nieces and nephews to me. So mm. like I said, I've been blessed with that. A lot of people don't. And, and healing the relationships is very important, especially for my son. Um, luckily for him, he was 14 months at the time. He doesn't actually remember the incident, but he did meet the guy and I did that uh, saved us from the water. They, my family took him out to dinner. I'm sad to say he passed away of uh, cancer, but we talked, we had a relationship and it was, it was a lot of things that happened. It's, it's not one thing, but if I can have a foundation to stand on to explain and really my success today and my ability to do what I do, it's my family. Thank you for your, your influence right here, right now. I think we have time for uh, a couple of more questions, perhaps. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gontilake? Yeah. Uh, so the next question um, is, I'll read out the whole thing. Um, I think that would do it justice. So thank you, Naomi. I was part of a class at Hamlin University in 2019 where you were on my panel for mental illness and criminal justice conference. I was wondering if you can speak more of, on your experience in segregation and how this affected your mental health and if this affected you in any way post-release. Yes. Absolutely, wonderful question, wonderful question. When I say I survived my 15 years in prison because of hip hop, here's where, it, here's where the rubber meets the road. So first of all, I went to segregation be, for, mental, for mental breaks because that's what they do in prison. When you have a, men, a, a, a mental health episode, which was a lot of times was precipitated by them running out of my medication not ordering it, having not, you know, they, it's many times they ran out of my psychiatric medication. 
And then I got punished for it because I experienced psychotic episodes and symptoms from my mental illness. And the only thing they do in that situation is put you in segregation. It's called COS status, continuous observation status. And what that means, you get a shower once every three days, you're in your room 24 seven, you don't get a phone call break. You don't get uh, a shower break. The, and the shower comes once every three days and you have to take a shower in front of two female officers. You're not even permitted to close the curtain or anything. So you take a shower while they're, they're standing there watching you. Um, no curtain, no nothing, no divider. They're watching you take a shower. And that's once every three days. You don't get phone calls, you don't get visits and you don't even get tissue or or cup and nothing's in your room. The only thing you get is what we call the pickle suit or the banana suit. If it's yellow, it's the banana suit. If it's green, it's the pickle suit, which is like a, a jumper, tear proof jumper with Velcro and a tear proof blanket. That is the only thing you have in those rooms. So the reason why I'm so passionate and I'm living proof that hip hop saves is because in that moment, I didn't have my family. I had my family, I can't call them. They can't visit on that status. So I don't have that. I don't have even toilet paper to wipe. I have to ask when the guard makes around, can I have some toilet paper? If I want water, I gotta ask for a cup, drink the water and get a cup back. I don't have a pen or paper to write. I don't have books to read. And basically I'm in a dark room alone with nothing. And the only thing that sustained me was music, was the lyrics of a song like KRS-One, I Will Make It, Never Give Up. Those two songs were in my mind. Now they were in my mind as if I had a stereo playing in the room. That's how, that's how much I heard them in my ear, in my inner ear. So that's the question I pose to other people. That's a good question, but that's why I'm so passionate. I want people to figure out what sustains them when everything has been taken away. When everything, your spouse, your kids, whatever, your food, everything's taken away. When everything's taken away from you, what will sustain you? That's what we need to get to and find. And it's also coincidentally where our purpose lies. Whatever that thing is that will motivate you and keep you going when all has been ripped away from you, what will sustain you? And for me, that was music and that was hip hop. Wow. Thank, thank you. Uh, uh, we have time uh, for one more question uh, before we take a small break. And so I'm gonna apologize right now to those who pose questions that we cannot uh, get to, but I have to. I'm obligated to uh, ask this next one because it's from, in my mind, uh, a dignitary or guest of honor for initiatives like us uh, for this call of action. And that is my friend, uh, David Starks. Thank you for being here. He asked the last question, Naomi, I want you to uh, speak to this and I'm interested as well. He simply asks, could you please break down the distinction between hip hop and rap? Oh, it's my favorite question. <laughs> Actually, my <laughs> book breaks this down perfectly, hip, yeah, Illegal and Hip Hop Tale. So great, wonderful question. What I wanna tell you, I love analogies and metaphors. So you like pizza, right? Uh, everybody loves pizza. Everybody can know pizza. Rap is a pizza. And you can get pizza anywhere, the supermarket. You can even get it at the gas station. Pizza's everywhere. Pizza, pizza, pizza. That's rap. Hip hop is the entire Italian culture, history, dress, land, language, and people. Hip hop is a culture lived by millions worldwide. But pizza is something that comes from, it's the most recognizable thing. It's the one that's oversaturated in the market. It's a million pizzas. And you get a pizza anywhere. That's only a part of Italian culture. But Italian culture is the people, the land, the language, the history, the dress, the customs, 
That's hip hop. Woo! <laughs> I love that. I got it. I will never forget that. Woo! Okay. Uh, we're preparing to take a 10 minute break because I think, as I said, that we were savoring what you were talking and we're going to have some breakout sessions, some breakout rooms. Uh, Raj is going to lead us to. Uh, so for right now, let's take a break. And I'm going to be very specific with the time. We have a 10-minute break. So we're going to be back here at 10.22. Thank you, everyone. Better be back. <laughs> and Better be back. Naomi Love to see you back. Time. Thank you again for yeah. an amazing, amazing morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Do I, do I get to come back? <laughs> yes. Certainly will. Yes. Okay. We're going to throw you in the room. Okay. <laughs> Raj again. And what Dr. Raj is going to do is set us up for the uh, breakout sessions. So the breakout Everybody session clap. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's move. Come on. Come on. Sharon Green. Come on. <laughs> Derek Krem, come on. come on. I need y'all to move. Okay, yes. this amazing <laughs> yeah. presentation, right? I mean, come on, Kareem, right? It's like, yeah, bro. It was heavy. Right. So, Raj, what are we gonna do in these uh, in these breakout rooms? What are we What are we gonna be? Well, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting that. <laughs> we, we, uh, Dr. Libby, I'm here. To, I'm here. No to, more bossing around me. <laughs> I'm here to push you. You're not the boss of me, Dr. Libby. No, I'm just kidding. Whatever that is, right? People say. Uh, but you know, no, you know, make sure we uh, do some self-care, right? And somebody asked uh, Naomi Gaines Young about how she does self-care. And I, I've seen the sister, um, you know, when we first met, we met at a restaurant. Right, uh, she's coming in there with a bike. Uh, she rolled in. We had a nice conversation. Uh, right, Naomi does an amazing work in terms of how she uh, right expresses herself through her poem, and and much much of her work is out there. Right, I hope you will access YouTube and get all the information, all the things you need of Naomi. And I'm hoping that you will be able to contact her. In a minute, I think Brian can throw her email, her contact information on, on, the, on chat. So make sure you all access Naomi, Naomi Gaines uh, for her wisdom, for her experience, and for her spirit, right? She shows up raw. She shows up human, right? Um, so towards that end, I want to make sure that we are all right, doing self-care. Self-care is not about self-indulgence, right? Um, self-care is about self-preservation right? so that we can continue to stay in the struggle. Struggle for justice, right? Struggle for our humanity. So uh, I want to kind of invite you to be present as you breathe in and breathe out, right? Just kind of let all of that you have heard, right? The difficult things, the painful things, the joyful things, the celebrations. I want to invite you to own them, right? As you own them, we are going to break up into smaller groups. And the, and the ask is this, right? When you break up into the smaller groups, we want to invite you to get to know who is in that small group with you in this breakout circle. Right. If we are going to move forward, we have to move forward as a collective. Right. Uh, uh, Kochiyama often talks about collective care. So let us practice that collective care by getting to know each other right, in our circles. Um, and make sure you, when you come out of that space, it, unless and until you have permission to use their name, right? Don't use their name uh, in any other circle outside of that immediate circle that you are, you are placed in. Um, 
if you have permission, you can share it, right? I know Naomi gives you permission. I know I give people permission, but many right, are still wanting to hold on to that confidentiality. So let us respect that. Uh, let us also respect the fact that when we are in circle, one person gets a chance to talk, the rest of us will have an opportunity to listen to one another. Right, and, and the ask is this, right? Very simple in trauma healing work, we say, try to listen to understand, not listen to respond, right? We wanna invite you to understand what is being said. Feel that emotionally and in your body, right? And try not to react to things in the spaces, right? where we wanna build relationships uh, and let us listen without judgment. And one of the fundamental things that we say in the, again, in the trauma healing spaces, right? If we wanna avert uh, and suspend judgment, we have to be grounded, right? When you are grounded, you are no longer in that space of survival. You are in that sort of, in the executive function of your brain and you, knew you are in your heart space. So we wanna invite you when you are in your respective circle, right? suspend that judgment, listen, understand, learn, right? so that we can together lead. Uh, and understand that when we are in circles, when we are in our breakout sessions, right? we are all equal, all our narratives, and stories as, as, um, as was said in the poem are different, but there are intersections, right? Let us share our narratives, our stories, and then collectively figure out where we are as a, as a, as a, as a circle, as a group. So those are some of the expectations, circle expectations we have when you are in your respective circles, right? So when you get there, uh, make sure you introduce yourself, take time to get to know one another. Two, uh, once that round is over, right? Then where we started, we'll start begin talking about what, what they heard when they heard this sister talk about her life, right? Her experience, about her wisdom, and, and how did that hit you, right? At an emotional level, at, in your body, where is it showing up? Share those things, right? Share those things with your circle, right? And make sure you make room for everybody to have time to share that when we are in, your, in, when we are in our respective circles, right? Um, and then, right, once we've done that, and then we can talk about what does this mean, right? What does this mean? Your feelings and how it shows up in your body, the wisdom, uh, the celebrations, the trials and tribulations of the sister. How does that translate into your profession, your work, your life? Right? What does that mean in your work, in your life? Right? And what lessons are you taking away from from this presentation, right? Uh, and then, right, if time permits, I want to invite you to share, right, how are you going to take this idea, not just for yourself, but also how you are going to show up with these ideas? How are you going to integrate these ideas so that we can make justice, not just a word, but a verb? Right? How do we put that into action in our spaces to liberate folks, to transform systems? Right? So you have a huge challenge ahead of us, right? Most of us come to workshops, we check our boxes and say, done, right? This ain't one of them. We don't want this to be one of them, right? Right, Michael? Michael's like, I've seen cloud veterans, health and systems, yeah. Right, uh, right. So let us, let us put this into action. So a couple of things, a quick reminder, let us respect everybody, 
right? Um, listen without judging, listen to understand, right? Everybody's story is equal uh, in our stories, right? Yeah. And then let us introduce ourselves. Let us talk about the impact of the words and the, and the wisdom shared by the sister. How does that show up in our bodies? How does that show up in our profession? And how are you going to take this wisdom and transform and liberate the spaces that you and I work in and, uh, and are a part of? Is that cool? Everybody, raise your fingers or whatever. Yes, Enoch. Enoch, it's been a minute, brother. How are you? What's going on, brother Dr. Raz? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, um, Raj, so uh, go ahead. Um, no, if I may, I'm going to, I'm putting um, the charge um, that you just outlined, putting a summary of it in the chat. Um, so that'll follow you into your breakout rooms. I'm just going to give a few extra minutes than we plan for the breakout. So we'll, uh, wrap up at uh, 1110 and come back to the, to the main room uh, to, uh, to do some reporting and processing. Of, uh, of where you've been today. So I uh, believe, Jody, are we ready? All right. And once you get in the pattern and the habit of making that change, you will reverberate like out to the larger circles and eventually, you know, a larger circle in whatever you do, so. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let us, let us share, right? I don't know what groups y'all were in. So I'm going to randomly ask group one, whoever was in circle one, uh, what, what was the conversation like in your circle? What did y'all listen, learn from each other? Come on. Oh, wow. Everybody's acting like, I don't know what group I was in. Okay. <laughs> Chelsea, I'm going to call on you. Chelsea B, go for it. I thought I was in group two. Okay. Yeah, what was it I like? Was group, I thought it was group two. He's in group what, two. What were y'all talking about? What was the conversation about? Oh my goodness, there's a lot. It's hard to summarize. Um... There is definitely a, a lot of deep seated conversations on how we, how the music industry heavily influences the culture and the environment and the system that we are a part of, as well as how do we incorporate preventative measures or rechange the narrative, mm -hmm. especially like with young people and the young generations and how we can try to start early um, to try to change the perspective of the music industry as well as how the current music narrative influences the behaviors, the perspectives, the romanticizing and the glorifying of aggression, violence, substance use um, in that kind of lifestyle. If anyone else in, my, in the group wants to contribute anything I missed, I'd be more than happy for that. No, you're doing great. That was pretty much it. We, we used a lot of uh, what Naomi had presented to us to uh, lead off our conversations and it got really heavy and um, we, we're looking forward to Naomi bringing more um, information in because some of it was shocking for me, even me and for many in the group, uh, we didn't know. So it was good, good information for us to um, project from. And I, that was a great summary you gave to Chelsea. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, uh, Ms. Wong, what group are you on? What did y'all learn? What did y'all talk about? I was in group three. Hey, hey. And I think the majority of the group was that um, how powerful Miss Nama's message was and her story. And um, more like what you said, not about the what, but more about the why. Um, we also talked about um, services or lack of services that we have. And, you know, I think most of us about how we're going to go forward from this training and what we would do. Um, you know, I just shared for myself, it's about for me setting that example and being more aware 
and really concentrating on the why. Um, we all, the probably half of us I know for sure were in corrections. So I think um, we might look at it. I know I do sometimes a little jadedly perhaps. Um, so I think it's more about that piece and about, you know, we really lack services. We realize that and it's about doing the best that we can. And um, in our recommendations, in how we look at certain people's behavior and why versus just that behavior. Um, and then um, how we choose to respond to those types of behavior and really looking in a big picture of what makes the most sense and what's going to benefit this individual. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Joyce. I mean, sometimes, you know, we know behaviors are only symptoms of a larger uh, pain. I think it was frustrating because, um, you know, we might know and want to recommend certain services. We kind of know what they need, but yeah, then the funding piece plays in, yeah. you know, and how do we do that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me pick on Mr. Owens, the, you know, the director of the St. Cloud Corrections or the superior there. Go ahead. I, I don't know about that title, but Joyce and Andrew in St. Cloud would probably say otherwise. But thank you, uh, Dr. Raj. Um, yeah, our group, and I'll, I'll try my best to summarize some of the excellence that was coming out of our group. Um, all of us was greatly impacted by uh, Mrs. Gaines. The young presentation was powerful in terms of how um, pointing out some of the specificity of the 10,000 hours, how that plays a role and that impact over all these years, putting it into those specifics, um, very, very powerful. The, uh, the produce you know, um, description, really, you're, you're very gifted uh, in how you can take something and, and change it into, you know, from everything from the, the produce section to your hip hop to rap and Italian pizza stuff. That that was uh, masterful. Although I want pizza now, but thank you anyway. But, <laughs> but, but just being able to put it into practical terms that anybody can understand. We talked about how the, the effect of postpartum, you know, depression and mental health, and some shared about how they have experienced some of those things and how impactful that can be. Um, during the break, I ran up and told my wife about this story and all this stuff. And she was like, oh my God, when I was pregnant, I felt that sick. You know, I mean, it was just, people can really feel that. But we talked a lot about how um, mental health in the black community um, and how to address that, um, how the PTSD or the post-traumatic slave syndrome, that book you, you pointed out, how impactful those things still affect us even today that we don't know. And there was some discussions as an agent for myself, working with clients of African-American men or, or women and stuff and how it's not really addressed. Mental health is not really addressed. So they, they've seen things that many people in war have come back and seen and they're in all kinds of programming, but you know, it's just another day in the hood, you know, and it's, it's not addressed. And they think that's normal. And I'm, you know, trying to helping people to be more to say, you know, if this ain't normal, we need help for that. And then there was some talk about, um, how do we heal? Um, there was some who talked about healing methods and how do we move forward and what, what we can do going forward. And, and these kind of dialogues, there was a lot of talk about how these are helpful and these discussions and how we can kind of talk about, you know, ways that we can move forward together. Um, and we really appreciated what you said about the evolving of one's mind. I think you said I might have misquoted you, but hmm. yeah, that yeah. part of it, because um, there, there is so much we can do with legislation but we all have a choice in what we can do, like you said earlier. Yeah, those kind of things, everyday thing that we're doing, interactions with our neighbor, interacting with people, people were sharing about how they've had interactions with other people or friends and how that can be, where it's just there's some tension or some you know, fear, fear when we don't have control of things and how we may feel fear on both sides and we react upon that. Um, but a lot of the stuff about how, what we can do moving forward and, and 
really starts with each and every individual one of us. There's no way to just legislate our way out of this or anything like that. We have to change as a people and stuff. So you really help spark some of those thoughts and thinking. So thank beautiful. I, I said it in the chat now, and I want to say it again. It just thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being willing to share your scar or or share your scars so that the rest of us around you can heal from ours is just this is something valuable. You know, Jesus still has his scars and we, we learn from those scars. And I believe when we people are willing to share some of these hurtful things and the things that have happened, there's so much growth and power from that. So thank you for even being willing to do this presentation. I know it's not- Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're so the welcome. The Enoch. I mean, his brother always throw down some wisdom. Uh, Mark the Thumbs, Thumbs, is it Tom Foot? I was in group two. So we, so just a little bit of a follow up. We did get into some of the costs and things too, like with the um, accessing mental health. And I didn't share this in our small group, but I'm so I um, do career planning, but we do make referrals. And I think that one of the things is just making sure that when you're making that referral, not looking at it from my lens, what's going to be best for that person. And sometimes that service provider might not be the one who's able to provide what that family needs and just due to the lack of understanding. Um, and then just really, I, I keep going back through the um, money lines and following the money. So anytime we are spending money or doing something, it's like, where does that um, money come through when you were doing that? apricot analogy i kept on thinking of the you know of the food co-op and not everyone knows like at the food co-op that you can use your ebt card or like um here i'm i'm out of rochester minnesota so mm -hmm. i just always appreciate all of the things mm -hmm. out of uh, metropolitan state so trying to for myself going into a space of getting information that's um not coming from a lens of, of someone who looks like me so um and um I, I just wanted to share too, thinking, um, Naomi, that there was a woman, I moved to Rochester to work at the women's shelter services, and there was a woman who had served time at Shakopee, and she really in, impacted my career as, as another mentor woman that I worked with. And so when I had shared that question about um, your self-care after giving a presentation, you know, it does take a lot of courage, but there is a lot of emotion then after, and just wanted to acknowledge that, that um, it is just really heartfelt for you to come out and share. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do want to share all the time because my thing, any health care issue, because mental health is a health care, chemical dependency is a health issue. And with any of those things, prevention is always the best motive to, you know, to keep people from, you know, falling, you know, from illness. It's just that we haven't quite gotten around to seeing mental health as on the same continuum is like cancer, heart disease, or, you know, whatever, but it, so it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's very important that you prevent these things. And I don't, I think more effort needs to be made towards that end. So thank you. Yeah, I want one last question about the, the cost. So what, was it a financial issue of not getting the medication? I wasn't real clear on that. And that so, sometimes they ran out of the medication, but certain, when I came there, they was like, uh, uh, this medication, they took me off. And a lot of women experience that when they go to Shakopee, that they're taking off their medication, not because it's not allowed, but because it's too expensive. Uh, one of my pills, uh, one of my psychotropic pills is $60. Shakopee didn't want to pay for that. So. So how do we advocate for that, like through legislation and things? Because I think just some of the things with pregnancy at the at, at the prison. Like, right. So you, we have to challenge and prevent these uh, contracts that go on between uh, prisons and the pharmaceutical company. They're mm -hmm. in bed together, and we got to disrupt that relationship because they're providing abysmal health care in prison because of these lucrative contracts but very, that the lucrative is uh, more profitable to the prison itself and than it is towards uh, transmitting that cost and having that cost later into the care of individuals being cared for under those contracts. So we need to think about that too. So it's just one area that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so that. Well, thank you. Um, I want to invite Michael. All right. uh, first, I want to know what the whole thing says in, the, in your back. And okay. Then, right. which group and what did y'all share? Yeah. Hi, and thanks again, Naomi. That was just mm -hmm. fantastic in your sharing. Uh, really touched my heart. So, thank you. Um, yeah, I was with uh, Owen's group as well, uh, Mr. Owen's group, and he yeah, he did a great job kind of putting our stuff together. Um, yeah, I'm with the St. Cloud VA uh, as a Veterans Justice Outreach Social Worker. So, um, you know, just as you know, uh, Naomi, as you were talking about your story, I just like I, I told the group I you know, felt kind of angry as I see more and more, you know, where we put people, I've been in this position as a veterans justice social worker at the VA for about six months and just how, you know, we're putting people in prison for addiction issues. It's just, it's just, it's crazy, you know, and then we're, and then they get out and they can't function because they've been in prison and no one's given them a chance and they get felonies and um, yeah, it's a, it's a real mess. So um, that we, we need to change, change a lot. I feel like we need social workers on every corner in this country. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yolanda, please tell me you're we're in a different group. Why do I keep calling all the same group? I was with Mr. Owen. And oh, uh, the only yeah. thing I can add to that that he um, spoke of, one of the, um, a lot of the people in our group worked with, um, they were social workers in, um, in different things, but one spoke that they were a social worker in the prison system and that they were taught more to restrain and to restrict. Um, and it came from when um, Miss Naomi shared about when she was experiencing the segregation part. And what she got, she said, how can I change that narrative of um, to hold, holding people accountable means that she said she represented it differently that you have to pull them in closer. <laughs> um, and then there's a care that's involved that it's the restraining and restricting is only going to make it worse or make it more profound, whatever the issue is, but it's not actually addressing the issue. It's not getting to, there's, there's something that happened, there's a what, but it's not addressing the why. And the question was, what do I need to do to start addressing the why? So that was, that was all I could add to what Mr. Owen said. Thank you. Uh, Amir Farah, tell me, please tell me you were in a different group. Or at least lie to me. <laughs> Amir Farah, no? Where are you? Okay. Amir is not there. We'll go to Helen Dane. Helen. Well, um, what did, did <laughs> what did you want me to contribute? What what did you what did y'all talk about in your group? Oh, um, I, uh, I think it was this, uh, group number three, I think. And uh, we did the uh, kind of a round robin on what we felt was one of the most impactful things from our, each of us shared what was more, what had the most impact on us from um, the presentation, which mm -hmm. I'm still reeling. I, I'm still doing what you said. I'm I'm sitting here absorbing it and thinking of every little aspect of it. And it was so good. I want to take it. I want to do something. I don't know what, but I'm going to do something to help make this message go bigger. Yes. Uh, thank you. And I think uh, Janice Moore, you were in group five, it seems like. Yes, I was. We all were um, basically discussing <clears throat> what part of 
like what part of our careers that we're at and how that impacts our um our outlooks on basically the conversations today and we had the pleasure to have Naomi in our um group as well so we got to hear a little bit of her input and her feedback um it's it was very exciting to see how we come from different backgrounds, but we all have the same goals and we all have the same beliefs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I basically took from the conversations today. Um, I'm trying to multitask, so I don't know if that's exactly what you asked, just to reflect no, from the group. That's good. That's good. That's but, good. But um, it was just, you know, it's, it's, it's just awesome just to, just to embrace the differences yeah. that we all have and to also see how they're, um, um, how they're so, how they're so intertwined within the universe and within our, um, just our community. And one thing I, um, took from that group is she told us about, um, utilizing our individual choices and understanding the power of those. So I just think that statement can just relate to today, how our choices all got us here today to be together. And you never know what things in life that you can experience that can um, trigger change or just trigger, um, well, not necessarily trigger, but just input up input change and make different inputs in your life so I just think that everyone um well I can speak for myself but I just feel like it's important that we all look to take something out of our experiences and I think that this platform today helped us to be able to get closer to that goal and to take just little bits and pieces from each other um, and make them our own and dispute them out to the universe so we can be able to help others. Because it seems like that's our common goal is to help each other. And while helping each other, we're helping ourselves and we're helping our communities. Right, right. Wow. Exactly. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm seeing a Tracy Green. What group were you in, Tracy? Voice is not the uh, Raven. How you doing, Raven? Raven? No. Wow. Either people don't like me. Okay, David, you better be speaking. <laughs> David starts. Oh, I think he had it. I thought David liked me, okay? Everybody's... Mm -hmm. He did say he'd have to step out and, be, and he'd be back. Oh, he did too, okay. Katie Willer, where are you? Hi, I'm here. Okay. So what are you learning? What, what's, what are some of the things that y'all discussed in your group? Well, I was in the group with Enoch and Michael and Yolanda, and they've spoke so eloquently about okay. everything. Um, Let's see, what do I have to add? Um, I think at least one person uh, spoke about um, the post-traumatic slave syndrome book. And I was thinking about that too. That's, that's a book that's been on my list to read for a while, but I haven't. And um, I think it's time for me to put it at the top of my list. I was really intrigued by some of the things that Naomi was talking about, some of the examples she gave, not only um, she gave the example about how this white mom versus this black mom speaks about their child and how some of that is rooted in historical trauma going back to slavery. And um, I, I want to learn more about that. So I'm going to put that book on the top of my list. To read. Right. Thank you, Katie. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Stephanie Sand. I feel like everybody has said everything. Okay. A lot we, a lot we talked right. about in our group. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot um, going on. Oh, that's all right. Uh, uh, time check. Kristen or Carissa, how are we doing? Time. About uh, um, five minutes remaining for report outs um, before we do our wrap up. 
Um, although it's kind of in the space that people want to speak, yeah. what yeah. they need to be said. And okay. Uh, let me let me call on two more people and then we'll we'll do the wrap up, right? A Angela, Rush is it Rushmore? Sorry, it always takes me a while to find the mute button. I was in Joyce's group, um, so she kind of covered what we discussed. I, yeah. I have one question, if that's okay to ask, but I'm okay. just the three. No, <laughs> that's the way. The three major companies that control the music that's put out, how do we put pressure on them to change? Um, it's unfortunate that the money they profit put into private prisons rather than um, services that our clients desperately need to avoid behaviors that get them to prison due to trauma they experienced. So it's just this main. Those three corporations, it, it, it's really deep because they're profiting on both ends. Um, I was in a session um, real quick. I was in a session um, a while ago. Um, Green, Miss Green, Dr. Green was in there with me where these women came from, I think they were uh, Norway. They went to Norway to visit a prison. And before the prison, they got there, they took the profits out of their prison system, which was a huge transformation. I mean, there was no, no, no fights. Uh, people rarely got in trouble. It was a more human person centered place. And they implemented it because their prisons mirrored the way ours are violent, recidivism, all the issues that surrounding um, prisons here in America, they had those issues. But when they snatched the profit out of the prison system, it they said they probably won't even need prisons right in the next 20 or 30 years because the 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 rate went down the recidivism went down um people coming back because it was set up for social services when people were leaving prison it was set up where the 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 focus was not punitive but uh you know uh, you know what what is supposed to be correct uh, you know like rehabilitation it wasn't punitive anymore and I know you guys hear about that mass shooting in Norway with that guy, you know, they only could only give him 20 years because that was the maximum he had mass shoot all those people. They said even with him, he has two or three people with him daily, like doing things like not punishing him, but like playing board games, um, really talking to him, counseling him. So when he leaves, there won't be created a monster because people are going in humans and they're coming out monsters not because they were a monster before because when exposed to the harsh realities of prison life if they don't adapt or change into becoming what they're around they they won't survive and so they carry that into when they leave so some people are going in but coming out monsters going in human coming out monsters and that's as a result of their experience and right they while there so if that model can work, that when they were talking about this and they would say it specifically was changed, that was the only thing they changed. They took the profit out of their prison system and total transformation for that prison system. So I think that could be, I think we can mirror that here. And as far as the yeah. corporations, you can Google on your phone right now and just say what music corporations and companies uh, invest in prisons and their names will come up. You can go, it's Google right there. And their names will come up, and that's how you put the pressure on them. Um, it's really a demand and supply thing because people feel like that's the only thing they have to offer is these artists. But if they invest in artists that are real artists and not you know, basically complete mantras of violence and sex and anti intelligence and stuff like that, if they promote an artist that would like that, um, it, they to me they will have more power it's kind of like uh to use a metaphor that movie monsters inc they scare because they care basically the, the monsters go around scaring kids for energy but when they found that when they make kids laugh they have even more energy it's 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 a metaphor for for life especially the music company if you make positive rights people will spend more on that than they do this other crap i really believe that i really do people want they want, they want basically the same thing. You want to be happy. You want your family, your friends, your loved ones to be happy. And you want to contribute something meaningful to society at the base level 
all human beings are like that. The problem is, is we think we have to do different things to achieve that. Mm. Mm. So. I see it's about 1140. So I'm going to ask Dr. Libby if we are good to pass it to the next level. To pass it to the next level. Yeah. Well, I just want to spend a minute um, in appreciation as we wrap up. So um, there are a lot of people who are involved in planning this series and have, you know, have worked on uh, URMI for many years. Um, so I re really just want to appreciate um, Brian Higby and Jody Bantley from the Institute for Community Engagement and Scholarship. I want to thank uh, Dr. Derek Krim and Dr. Darshini Gunataleka from the uh, Faculty in the Human Services Department. Uh, I want to thank David Starks, who has been a longtime proponent of URMI and um, was, was recruiting people to come to our events from prison, which tells you a little bit about that man. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Kristen Bubel also of the Human Services Department for all her uh, staff support, um, which we uh, cannot do an event like this without. Um, uh, God, I'm so concerned I'm going to forget people. Uh, Sharon Brooks Green uh, for all that she's brought to this event over the years and her co contributions today. Um, now, uh, thank you to the Office of the Dean of Students, um, the Collaborative Health Grant, the Office of the Provost, and the Office of the President, uh, who provided the financial support uh, for days, uh, today's event and our, um, our previous event. Um, oh my goodness, folks, who am I, who am I forgetting? I mean, uh, Raj and Naomi, of course, but is there anyone else that I'm failing to mention? Mm. Okay, great. Uh, I can't thank enough my partner in this endeavor from the beginning, uh, Dr. Raj. Um, I had a little idea and he turned it into um, a big event, a big happening, um, you, know, in, uh, you know, in support of our students and in support of the movement. And, um, and this would not be what it is every single year if not for his work. Um, and, uh, and of course, I have to finish with thanking Naomi Gaines Young again for her amazing, amazing presentation today, uh, for, uh, sharing the reality of your story, for um, uh, expanding our perspective, for giving us information that we need to move forward as we continue to generate action um, in response to uh, mass incarceration um, and in its many aspects and the um, white supremacy that keeps it in place. So thank you again so, so much. Um, thank you. Yeah, of course. Everyone will be receiving a follow-up email uh, quite soon. It'll include information about um, the, uh, the two events that we'll be holding in the late summer, early fall. Um, but even before you get that, you'll get the link to today's talk and to the uh, videos that uh, Naomi used in her presentation. Um, and uh, a reminder again that uh, a week from today, we'll have the uh, day of honoring learning and action um, in person uh, on our St. Paul campus. Um, and the link to register for that is in the chat. And yeah, I can't wait to see some people in person. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the final thank you to everyone who showed up and participated today. Thank you, you're awesome. You know, you know go out there and do what you've been inspired to do. Everyone take care. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. See you all soon. Bye. Bye now. Be blessed. Yeah. Bye, Judy. Bye, Judy. Bye, Sharon Green. Good to be Hello. with you. Great. Thank you. Uh,